So the 25th anniversary of New Wave, what does it mean to me? Um, well, I, I definitely think it was a, a, you know, a fresh start for a lot of bands. Um, um, it seemed to me that you'd had all the classic bands like, you know, Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and, and uh, I was aspiring to be like those sort of bands. And then along came punk rock and uh, pretty much changed everything. And, and uh, they seemed to be saying, you, you know, you can form your own band, you don't, you know, and I thought, okay, I haven't got to be like Richie Blackmore then. I haven't got to spend the next 15 years practicing until I can play like Richie Blackmore. I can just, uh, you know, I can play pretty vacant, you know, that's okay. Um, so that inspired me to just, let's go, let's, let's form the band, let's do gigs. Don't worry about being as good as, as uh, Deep Purple, because you, you, you don't have to be. The term new wave of British heavy metal to me means nothing compared to what a lot of people think it means. When I first started playing the drums and wanted to be in a rock band, that's all I ever wanted to be. I was inspired by seeing bands such as the Scorpions, UFO, Deep Purple, Rainbow, Thin Lizzy, Nazareth, the list can go on and on. And when I saw the guys on that stage, that was what I wanted to be. I mean, the whole tour was just, was just great. It, it was such a, such a pleasure to, uh, to do. To play every night to sold out houses, it's been such a long time since I've done anything like that. Um, and I, I mean, Dave was saying, came into the dressing room after the first night and said, uh, you know, it's great to have you guys, you know, on tour with us. And uh, you know, if there's anything you need, if if your if your amps break down, we'll get them fixed. You know, if you need uh, if you need anything, if you yeah, you know, we'll sort it out. We were getting you know sound checks. We're getting catering. Uh, you know, nothing was too much trouble. We were using you know the full rig and the lights and and so to be accept accepted every night by. Uh, Megadeth's crowd, because of course, you know, we, they'd come to see Megadeth, you know, primarily this audience. We didn't particularly know how Diamond Head were going to go down in front of these, you know, new crowds. They could have gone, oh, you know, get off. But um, they, they really warmed to us really quickly. And uh, so it, it became, became uh, a fabulous tour. From the first night in Ireland, we thought, you know, wow, you know, that's going to be hard to beat. And uh, it, it just got better and better, and uh, it was a it was an incredible experience. I loved it. <laughs> we played in front of forty thousand people on the whole tour, and we were expecting a lot of grief and pressure and stress, and uh, it turned out to be the complete opposite. And so I suppose really to nail it down, the fact that we were accepted by forty thousand people across Europe as being a great band, and we didn't, you know, we had no idea how we were going to be received. We thought we could do the first show in Dublin and people would just go, boo, you know, get the fuck off the stage, who are you? You know, you shouldn't be up there with that, you know, so and so and so and so. But uh, I think that's the best thing, that the band actually pulled off what many people thought we would never be able to do. So that's probably the greatest moment of the whole thing. Probably the, f the first album I bought was Led Zeppelin II, so I was off to a good start. Partly because my brother Dave played guitar and uh, taught, you know, me. Uh, so that was a big album. I think he'd already got it or borrowed it or I'd heard it, you know, but I listened to that to death. And then Machine Head by Deep Purple. The album that changed my life was Sladeist, the compilation of uh, Slade hits. I played that album to death and that's the album that I started to practice drums to. Slade, I probably along with the Wild Hearts, are my favourite band. And that's definitely inspired me. Even before a teenager, when I was 11 years old, I would be over at my grandfather's house um, with uh, his two teenage sons. And we'd be air drumming and air guitars to Sladeist and all that kind of stuff. So that's the album for me. I'm a big film fan. I love films. I, uh... I don't, um, I don't know if one film changed my life. There's, there's loads I remember. Um, obviously I went to see Star Wars and Jaws and you know, all the usual things. Uh, I, I, I did like Jaws. I like Steven Spielberg's films. I think, yeah, you know, he's got a style. Uh, I managed to sneak in to see The Exorcist. That totally <gasps> freaked me out. I mean, that was gotta be like one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Um, Sliding Flame. 
goes without a doubt. It's simply the greatest, I, th I feel, the greatest um, music film of all time. As it, when you actually look at it, it really does portray all the pitfalls of the music industry. And I think at the time, it's like, I want to do this even more. I really do want to be in a band, and I do want to make records, and I do want to go on the road, and all the trimmings that come with that. So that for me, uh, Slide in Flame, and along with The Exorcist. Starman, I thought was a great film. Uh, Poltergeist, uh, I like uh, The Abyss. That probably wasn't a teenager by then, but uh, I don't know if there's one in particular that changed, you know, changed my life. I remember my brother taking me to see uh, Gibby Shelter, but I, I didn't quite uh, understand it. I would have one of Jimmy Page's Les Pauls. I, I'd like to meet Jimmy Page, I've never met him. Um, and he's got some nice, you know, with probably 58 or something, 57, 58 Les Pauls. Just standards, but with a nice tiger stripe finish and all that. And I'd like one of them. I'd, you know, Jimmy Page come to me and say, Bright, you know, you're a good player. You can have one of me at guitars. I would go, thank you very much. But <laughs> uh, it's yet to happen. Uh, one would be probably Bonham's, uh, uh, not necessarily Bonham's, but a Ludwig Vistalite kit from the 70s, which my sister in law owns. She has a blue Vistalite Ludwig kit. But more than that, I'd probably say a 1940s Slingland Radio King, which was played by Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa, because um, that was the drum kit of the day, and Slingland Radio King snare drums are hired for like four or five hundred bucks a day in New York. So a Slingland Radio King drum set, definitely. The high point, really, of Diamond Head uh, in the olden days, I think, was probably around the period of 1982. Uh, we'd made this album called Borrowed Time, and then uh, that came out and went straight in the chart at number 24, which was fantastic for us. And, um, and then we got the Reading Festival, which we'd never done before. And we got to do the Friday night. I think we were pretty much headlining the Friday night because uh, a band called Man of War pulled out because of visa problems or something. So MCA managed to get Diamond Head on the bill. And, uh, we did that, which was fantastic. It was our biggest crowd to date. We played to 10,000 people, and uh, that was filmed for a live album, and um, that, was a, that was a really good performance. And then we did the Borrowed Time tour, which is a tour of you know, the major theatres of the UK, the Hammersmith Odeon, Birmingham Odeon, all, all of the classic venues that you, you dream about playing. You know, we, and we got our own lighting rig and our own PA, and uh, that, that felt like we were getting somewhere then. The only problem with it was it, it, it all seemed to be over too quickly. It was like pretty much a two-week tour of the UK. And then it was, OK, lads, you know, you better start thinking about your next album, you know, and it kind of back down to earth, you know. Could, it's, when you look at bands like Metallica doing two years on the road, I've just, just got no idea what that must be like to, to be away from home for, for two years. It's an incredible feat of uh, endurance. Uh, yeah, the longest we ever did was about five weeks. Um, well, I think that the first album, the White Album, probably because it was it was so, you know, it was there. Nobody else was like that. It was like, whoa, what is this thing? Um, so probably the White Album, and then the first studio album would probably be Borrowed Time, which I thought was great. I mean, I actually thought Canterbury was a great album. I mean, I was in a band at the time by the name of Chase, and the bass player. Kev, uh, Kev Harris was working for MCA and every time I would go over to his house he would have Canterbury on in the car and we'd be singing you know all the tracks making music out of One More Night all that stuff but no the White Album and Borrowed Time definitely those two albums. I first met Brian 1984 at um, there at Diamond Head Studio in Lye in the West Midlands. I was rehearsing there with Chase, the band that I was playing with at the time. Uh, Diamond Head, I think, had just um, were no longer with MCA, and they were recording their own album in the studio. And uh, I met Brian because he was coming into the studio to lay down tracks. And 
the studio was still being built at the time while we were rehearsing there. So uh, that's how I met Brian. He'd keep coming into the studio, I'd say hello, how are you doing, and all that kind of stuff. And then um, Sean and Brian sort of, to use Sean's words, transmogrified. And um, Brian started to work on his own album, to which I offered my services as a drummer. I said, look, if you need someone to do drums, give me a call. And um, I just purchased a brand new Yamaha kit. And I was sitting at home about quarter past ten, one Tuesday night. The phone rang and Brian said, you want to come over and do some drums? And so I'll be there in 45 minutes. That's how I met Brian, 1984. Uh, the main reason we'd, we'd kind of run out of steam by then. I mean, we'd, we'd been signed by MCA in 82. Then we'd done two albums and we got dropped in 1984 over disputes about, you know, management and... I mean, you know, we'd already lost Colin and Duncan by that time anyway, and we got a different drummer and different bass player and things. But we also, we, we'd started recording an album in 84 that never got finished. And I think uh, our manager tried to get a deal with it, went to meet them, the, you know, the French festival for music or whatever, and pretty much got a bit of a lukewarm re reception to it, you know, and it, it kind of deflated us and we, we sort of all went back to our homes sort of a bit disappointed and it, it kind of split up really and, and disbanded and there was a period where we didn't really see each other and it, it all kind of fell apart you know we, we kind of didn't know what to do next everybody just kind of drifted away you know the crew all went off and started working with other bands and it was it was left to me and Sean to pick up the pieces and it took a long time for that to happen really. I think the reason Diamond Head split in 85 was they no longer had a, a record company and they no longer had money to keep the band around. Um, so there was only Sean and Brian left, obviously from the original lineup. All the other guys, you know, got families, homes to keep. And as a musician, you have to go and find where the work is and put money on the table. Because you've got to pay the gas bill, the electric bill, you've got to put gas in the car and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's why they, you know, transmogrified that um, just lack of money. And also, I think, not quite as much interest. And also, the whole Rick thing had changed. You know, Def Leppard come along with Pyromania and this huge sound, and Van Halen came along with Jump. And the whole concept of rock music had changed. We were getting into singles, and, you know, when I heard Jump being played in a disco, the whole rock thing changed. It was a, it was a different beast now. It wasn't like what I thought it would be, like in the 70s, you know, UFO did an album, then they did a tour, then they went into an album. You didn't have to have singles. Uh, Lars Ulrich's role, I, I mean, Lars pretty much, uh, he bought the first album through mail order because we were selling it in sounds for £3.50. And I think he bought a copy over in San Francisco. He used to get sounds, you know and uh, loved the album and uh, came over to England to see us and he turned up at this gig called the, the Woolwich Odeon on the night of the Woolwich riots so I don't think there was many people in but um, he came backstage and introduced himself and he was only about 17 uh, but we warmed to him because we thought wow this guy's come all the way from San Francisco to see us you know that had never happened before uh, and we thought, well, you know, so where are you staying and all that? And he was like, well, I don't, I don't know, but not in that accent. But uh, uh, so we said, you come and stay with us if you like. Uh, so he, he literally jumped in the van with us, you know, and came back up to Birmingham and stayed with me for a week. And he, and he just slept on the floor in, a, in an old sleeping bag, really, for a week, you know, I had no idea. Uh, and then he stayed with Sean for about a month. And uh, he used to come to the gigs with us. And uh, he'd just uh, squash in the car. We all used to go in one car, you see. So there'd be four of us in the, in the back seat of a car, you know, and probably Colin, Duncan, me, and Lars all sat there like this, you know, on, all the way up to Leeds and things like that. And uh, I mean, I had no idea he was going to be a drummer for a start. And, in a, you know, one of the biggest bands in the world, Metallica, you know, no idea. He never once said, he came to, used to come to rehearsals and he never once said, can I have a go on your drums, you know? Oh, oh I've got an idea for a, for a riff or whatever. So he, I don't think he even said, I am going to form a band, you know, when I go home. So eventually he went home and uh, 
he used to write letters and stuff and I can remember having a letter off him saying I formed this band you know it's called Metallica you know and we're rehearsing like six nights a week and all that and, and I mean I knew lots of guys in bands you know uh, so I didn't take, think a lot of it uh, and it didn't dawn on me really the importance of it until I remember reading in 1985 I think it was uh, that Master of Puppets sold a million copies and I'm starting to think wow you know he's doing better than I am you know uh, so that was like a wake-up call and then they came over and uh, I mean they covered first of all they covered Am I Evil you know so that was fantastic um, but I still didn't have a clue how big they were going to be nobody did really um, so they played Birmingham Odie and he invited me down and uh, I got up on stage with them and played Am I Evil with them and met, met them all. I met Cliff Burton, which was nice. And, um, you know, I thought they were all nice guys and, and I've, I've, you know, been involved really on and off with their progress ever since. Uh, fantastic. God bless them. I think the, the role Lars Ulrich had really is, was making Diamond Head become a worldwide name. Um, Diamond Head could have filtered out like a lot of the new wave of British heavy metal bands, but because they were in a class of their own, um, obviously it got Brian was like writing really, really great riffs, great guitarists, but also they had, they had Sean on vocals and he had a, a great voice. And the two of them together wrote really, really well. And, you know, you've only got to listen to it. I mean, you know, for a band, like at the time, the biggest rock band in the world, Metallica, to be covering four tracks, I mean, is a statement. It really is a statement to A, the quality, and also Lars saying thanks, because if I hadn't have met you guys, I hadn't have come to see you, stayed at Brian's house, stayed with Sean, so there'd be no Metallica. Maybe, you, you, you have no idea. So I think, you know, Lars, understands the importance of Diamond Head. And we understand the importance of what Lars and Metallica have done for Diamond Head. I mean, you know, here we are 25 years on, we're about to do the London Astoria, 25 an year anniversary of New Wave of British Heavy Metal, of which we're doing a DVD for. And, um, you know, there it, there it is. I mean, Lars has played a great, great part in the history and maintaining the forward momentum of Diamond Head. Uh. Okay, well, we, we didn't record with Dave Mustaine. Uh, what happened was um, Dave Mustaine wanted to get involved in some way. He said, if there's any way I can help out with you guys, uh, I will, you know. So I think it was, it came down to, he said, on mix, because we'd recorded most of the album by then. This is a Death and Progress album. So we sent two master tapes over to uh, California or wherever it was he lived, I can't remember. And uh, he put some guitars on them. He said, do you mind if I put some guitars on them? Said, Please do, you know. Uh, and he mixed um, this track called Trucking and sent it back and said, what do you think? And of course, we all thought it was fantastic. So uh, we, owed, we owe him a, a debt for that. And uh, he was only too pleased to help out, you know, a band he, he was uh, influenced by. And uh, uh, he, he returned a favor, really, and uh, played on our album for us. Great, great guy. Working with Dave Mustaine on the uh, Death and Progress album, I personally, obviously, the tapes were sent to, um, to his studio in Arizona, and uh, what he did to the track trucking was great. You know, it was just another, how can one say it, another thing that we could reach for. A lot of bands aren't in that kind of situation where, on the Death and Progress album, oh yeah, we'll have Tony Iommi come in and do a solo on Starcrossed. Oh, we'll get Dave Mustaine to do this on trucking. I mean, it's that's just huge, you know. It sounds like name dropping, but it, but it's not. When you can get respected artists who are offering their services to be part of something, you can, all you can do is acknowledge the fact that they want to be part of it, and you know you have something here that people want to be part of. So I, it was great that he wanted to be part of it. it really was. Uh, Tony. Uh, I mean, being a Midlands, you know, guitarist, the same as uh, as the Diamond Head. Uh, I think it was a case of he he'd heard about Diamond Head and and we'd been in touch over the years and not only we'd supported them, but uh, somebody put us in touch with them and said, um, uh, "Would you like to write a song with Tony Omi? 
<laughs> you know, that don't happen every day. So I was, yes, please. OK, what do you want me to do? So they said, all you've got to do is drive over to Tony's large house in Solihull and uh, write a song with Tony Omi. Fantastic. So I turned up at the door and uh, he was coming in, have a cup of tea, you know. Very, very nice guy, very down to earth. And I was really uh, pleased to see, because I've got my way of working, which is riffs and, you know, cassettes and compiling and, you know. And I was really pleased to see that he worked in exactly the same way. He got a big drawer full of cassettes. Right, pop one on and we sit there and listen to some of his riffs. And we go, yeah, that's a good one. And then put my cassette on with my riffs on. Sit there, that's a good one. And then we just pieced piece the song together. We'd take it back, you know. Sh Sean would uh, say, well, that's a good, that'd be good for the verse, you know, and I'll start writing the lyric for that. And, and uh, a great experience, you know. Took probably a couple of weeks and it was done. The work that Tony Iommi did on Starcrossed, I thought was, well, there's actually a real uh, story that goes with Starcross. We actually started to track Starcrossed and we hadn't actually quite nailed it on the head. And myself and Sean got into sort of studio head to head kind of stuff where I was staying through the wind and saying, What the fuck do you want me to play? kind of shit, you know what I mean? And uh, it took us a while to actually nail the arrangement down. Halfway through the track, you'll hear a tempo. There's a BP, BPM change, which I had to work out on the fly because the, the track wasn't happening at the tempo it was. And then um, next thing I had a phone call. It was like, Tony Iommi's going to do the solo on it. I thought, dude, this is the greatest shit in the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a band and Tony Iommi's doing the, the guitar solo. It was phenomenal. I mean, you know, when you hear it, it's just, wow, great. All the grief that went through between myself and Sean, putting the, the drum track down and then uh, Pete doing the bass and then Brian doing the guitars, Sean doing the vocals, and then Tony coming in and putting the guitar solo down on the end just really made all that stress and it was stress for the, a period of like three or four hours in the studio. Just like, oh, great. You know, there's nothing worse than being in a studio and banging your head and doing all this thing and it sounds, oh. But it came out really great. And for it to be the lead track on Death and Progress as well was you know, great. I, fir I first met Nick uh, last, I think it was 2003. Uh, the end of 2003. Uh, I mean, it'll probably tell you how he joined, but Carl um, had seen him rehearsing and, uh, you know, got his number and said, you better check this guy out, you know, he's good. So I found Nick up and uh, went to see him in a local band. He was playing in Wolverhampton. And uh, I thought, what a fantastic singer, you know, what a, what a br perfect, really, you know, ideal for Diamond Head. So I talked to him. Uh, and he was, you know, he was fortunately up for the gig, you know. We, f at right around the time, we were kind of, you know, looking for, for, for someone. And, uh, and then the other big question was, could we write together? And uh, uh, that happened as well. We, uh, we started writing and, and just got better and better. Because sometimes you don't know, you know, who's to know if, uh, if it ain't going to work, if there's going to be no magic or, or if, you're just going to not be able to com com combine ideas and uh, the album came around quite quickly, so great. First met Nick, um, two th summer of 2003 after we played Wacken. Uh, we did the Wacken Festival with Jess Cox as a sort of a um, diamond pantang or Tigers of Diamond Head kind of band and um, I went to visit an old student of mine and uh, Nick was playing in the, in the band and uh, that's when I first met Nick and heard him obviously and uh, was really taken back with him. I really was, I was like, ooh, this guy's pretty good, yeah. The difference in approach between Death and Progress and uh, All Will Be Revealed was mainly, it was a lot quicker and it was a lot more focused. Um, Death and Progress seemed to drag on. We started making demos for that in Nine, in two, no, in 1990, and the album didn't come out until 93. So it was on and off, took, you know, uh, three years nearly, and cost a fortune as well. But with, with All We Be Revealed, we wrote it quite quickly, like six months on and off, and it was done. And then we recorded it quite quickly, so there was more of a, an energy and a, 
uh, freshness. It, it was just, um, it just seemed to come together a lot quicker. And uh, we weren't, we weren't, you know, exacting over every detail and, and paranoid about, uh, oh, it's got to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know. Uh, so it was quite, uh, quite fun to make compared to some of the other Diamond Dead albums, which have been uh, tortuous at times. I mean, the first album was good fun to make. Uh, but that, that had had a lot of preparation from, from songs we'd had a while and live work. Whereas uh, uh, with the All Would Be Revealed album, we hadn't really had a chance to gig any of the songs, but uh, it still came together really, really quickly and uh, was, was an enjoyable experience. Death and Progress was done with the help of a record company. Um, uh, Bronze, Pete Winkleman, and it ended up coming out on Castle. With, um, with All Will Be Revealed, it was a self-financed thing where I t took over a lot of the engineering once the basic tracks of drums, bass and rhythm guitars were done with um, Phil English down at Great Linford. And um, we moved then up to Birmingham where I did most of the tracking. But with Death and Progress, we used Andrew Scarth, you know, Tina Turner, Bad Company, Reputation. So I suppose that was real slick, real professional. Yeah, we're in the studio and All Will Be Revealed was much more, we've got to do this on our, on our own and we'll see what comes about. And the, there were two different experiences. One was under the microscope, working with a producer who's worked with some real heavyweight cats. Andrew Scarth, I mean, you know, he's like, I mean, I, I went to his apartment and he's got like, you know, the, the equivalent of gold discs, but they're gold like um, reels for all the and platinum stuff that he's done. And it was like, ooh, wow, you know, so you're sitting there, you're doing your drums and you're thinking, is this guy thinking I'm any good or what? I mean, like, but um, of course you have none of that when you're doing your own album and you're on your own. Uh, I was more concerned with like, I hope I don't fuck this up, can you see? I mean, oh, could you do that take again, Nick? I'm sorry, I missed that line. Um, that was the main difference, really, is the fact that Death and Progress was a real record in the Passai, a record company, producer, engineer, and um, All Will Be Revealed was us, Diamond Head, as a band, um, moving forward, obviously because of what had happened with the departure of Sean, and to see whether or not we could actually do this. Sorry. Hi. Hey, how you doing? How do you get the gig? Um, Carl, the drummer, spotted me, really. Um, Carl lives in America, and he came over to see his mother, who lives in Cannock, and I live in Cannock, and I sort of, I was jamming this local band, and he came to see his friend, who was the drummer in the band, and um, saw me and thought, hmm, you know, this could be the guy. And um, the next day, he got in touch with Brian, and uh, Brian got on the phone and it kind of, kind of went on from there, you know, uh, and developed from there. We went over to Brian's and uh, we just did stuff straight away, man, it was wicked. It's as I'd been in the band forever. It, we just gelled. Perfect. It was scary, really. Yeah. Was it scary stepping into Sean? <clears throat> well, to be honest, I've never really thought about stepping into anybody's shoes. It, it was never it, never an issue for me because we'd written 12 brand new songs and um, we was doing a brand new album so it was like a brand new band you know what I mean um, because I guess if we if it was just to go and do the old Diamond Head stuff or the classics and there was nothing creative happening you know I don't know whether it, I'd have done it you know what I mean it, it was uh, but because we was creative and there was that flair there it stopped straight away and um, it was great, you know. We had the same ideas, me and Brian, you had the same ideas as me and connected great. Can you talk, tell us Nick, about where you come from in terms of your experience, the Robin George band and what, where it was that it all started for you? Um, well, the last project I did, sort of band project thing, was with Robin George and um, that kind of went on for about five years, you know, and it was it, that was that was good. So that was the last project I did, and then I took five years out after that. The album got released, and we toured the country, and then I took five years out. You know, I, I, I just kind of fell out of love with the whole thing. I don't know. So, really, when when Carl found me, 
the drummer. I'd only been sort of back on the circuit for a week, you know, which is which is kind of weird, really. So, in a week of getting back into it, we got Dom dead on the phone saying, "Can you front the band?" No. Talking about influences now, <coughs> who was your favourite ever drum band, whatever era? Um, well, you see, I mean, I was brought up on sort of rock and roll. My parents were, um, there was Little Richard playing in the house, all the old 50s stuff, you know, Etta James, rhythm and blues type of stuff, um, Muddy Waters, um, Howling Wolf, all these great uh, blues and rock and roll artists. And I was brought up on that, you know. And um, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, I like Elvis Presley for what he did, you know, he, he kind of invented sex into rock and roll, and he kind of turned music upside down, really, with what he did. Uh, it was fantastic, so Elvis is a great front man. Of course, then you got Freddie Mercury, which a lot of people know is a great front man. I like what he does, the way he captures an audience, you know. Um, and then there's a lot of people I like that you've probably never heard of because um, not everybody gets the chance, do they, to, to make it big. And uh, There's a band called Spearhead I saw in Birmingham not so long back. I was blown away. It's like a funky sort of, a funky outfit. And the, the front man was fantastic from San Francisco, you know, and the way he captured an audience. A bit of a poet as well, so people were listening, you know, it's like when he speaks, the, the room was silent. And I thought, well, that's good, you know. He got him in the palm of his hands, you know. And on your travels before joining Diamond Head, I understand that you nearly hooked up and formed a band with Jason Bonham. Yeah, nearly formed a band. I mean, they, they got on the phone to me to with possibilities to join their band, you know. Um, but at the time, I was doing the Robin George project. And we'd, we'd been on Radio 1. We did, we did a session with... Bon Jovi on Radio 1, we've been on the TV, and it was all kind of, you know, on the way up. So it was a difficult time for me to go, well, forget that. You know, I was loyal to what I wanted to do and what I'd worked on. And um, and I guess I turned turned Jason down. I mean, he asked me if I could go and jam with him, so I didn't even give it the chance to go and jam with Jason, you know. But the possibility was there to, to jam with Jason, which is great. You know. Do you have any regrets about that? Uh, no, well, Curiosity got the best of me, you know, and I, I kind of rang him up. Um, I rang up the guitarist in the band a, uh, like a year later and asked how they did. And they toured the States with David Lee Roth and a few other people, and they released an album, and uh, it didn't go in the shops, apparently, and then it fizzled out. I think they changed the band from Bonham to Motherland, and then he created his own band called the Jason Bonham Band, so... Um, no, no, no regrets at all, I mean, it's... You choose your path, don't you? You know. And your path this year, first year with, with Diamond Head, was the, the tour with Megadeth. And yep. Doing the album. Yep. All will be revealed. Tell us about those two things and how it sort of brought you <sighs> into the band. What brought me into the band? Yeah, just in terms of you know, the tour and getting into the tour lifestyle with Diamond Head and all that. Uh, yeah, well, the tour was wicked, man, you know. It was really great. Um, and, and to be honest, I've, n I've never really played in front of three and a half thousand people before. Uh, we started off in Dublin and we finished off in southern Spain and the biggest crowd we had was 12,000, I think, in southern Spain. Whew. It's great, you know, great for me. And because as the tour gets on, goes on you get better and better and more confident and by the end of the tour like I was like right you know what I mean here I am man you're having it you know it, it was great you know you start to get into your stride you know it's like... and how about the album all will be revealed when did you start writing and writing with Brian and how did that when did I start writing it yeah it was probably about two weeks after we'd agreed that I was going to jump on with Tom did and do it so we got into the writing straight away pretty much you know I used to go up to Brian's house and uh, start writing in his studio he'd give me riffs I think he'd, uh, he'd, he'd done riffs that he gave to Dave Mustaine of Megadeth that nothing sort of evolved with and um, 
it'd, it'd give me riff tapes after riff. I think he's got a shelf about that long of riff tapes, you know what I mean? It's like difficult. It, it's, he's the riff master, you know what I mean? He's, he's incredible. So I'd pick one, I'd go, that's a good riff. Yeah, that's a good riff. And I'd write, I did sort of develop from there, you know? And I'd start writing the lyrics and I'd, I'd just be sitting in my kitchen thinking, fuck, what can this be about, you know? And uh, it, it just clicked you. It wasn't hard. The end product, the end product, we, did it come as you expected it would be? Different? It was better than I expected it to be, because, you know, when you start writing an album, you, you, you don't know whether the songs are going to be there, you know? And I think the album is pretty strong, song-wise. You know, I do like a song and I do like a chorus. And the riffs are there as well, so I think you know the key ingredients are there. You know what I mean? It's, and it's better than I expected it to be. I've never written an album before solely. I mean, I've written all the lyrics uh, to Brian's music, and um, I've never written a whole album lyrically before. So it was challenging, but um, it, it was really good. You know. What, what are the plans for the next six months? <clears throat> is this chair spinning round? <laughs> Uh, next six months is uh, beginning of the new year, start touring, promoting the album. Um, just playing live in, in front of a crowd, you know, that's where I get my enthusiasm off the crowd. You know, on the Megadeth tour, the crowd was fantastic, you know, and I was, I was blown away by the response we had, you know what I mean? It was every night we went down a storm, and, um, and I, I kind of did, didn't know what to expect when we did the Megadeth tour. A lot of people thought, well, is the band going to be subpar without the old singer, you know, is the new singer any good? But like, as soon as I walked out on stage and uh, opened my mouth, people must have thought, you know, let's rock, you know what I mean? And, and it was great, it worked. And I've never had a problem on the tour, it was fantastic. Um, and you're writing songs already for the next album? Writing songs already for the next album, yeah. Um, Brian's giving more riff tapes, you know. More riff types, and yeah, uh, we're starting writing new so stuff. Never be short of riffs. Never be short of riffs. Never. Thanks very much, mate.